also like to welcome you to today's webinar, Best Practices in Enterprise and Facility Optimization, brought to you by Emerson. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please note that this presentation's audio is provided by phone or through your computer sound system. If you would like to revisit key sections of today's webinar, it will be available on demand at climate.emerson.com slash E360 webinars a few days after this live event. You'll also receive an email in the next few days with a link to the recorded event. Discussing today's topic will be Ron Chapik and Scott Fritz. Ron is the Director of Product Marketing responsible for ProAx Enterprise Software and Services. Over his 30-year career in sales and product and strategic marketing management roles, he is focused on bringing new products to market for the PC-based data acquisition, industrial automation, process control, SCADA, and intelligent building segments. Most recently, his focus has been on leveraging new software tools and platforms to better serve the multi-site retail segment. Scott has 25 years of experience managing large volume service centers, workflow, and process improvement within multiple industries. In his current role, he's responsible for Emerson's enterprise services and information technologies operations, managing the delivery and support of proact services for a diverse range of clientele. The webinar will now begin. Ron? Thank you, Nina. Uh, before we start, I'd like the attendees to uh, keep in mind or be reminded that these best practices uh, create value, and that value is measured exclusively in time and money. So time and money will be a theme they will continue to focus on throughout this presentation. The opportunity is pretty straightforward. Today, the need to create value based on software and services has never been greater. If you look at the quotations that we have, that we've collected along with many others in many of the customer visits that we make, you see a common theme. How do I save time? How do I prioritize what I'm working on? And how do I save money? Help me identify the next most important thing. I need to fix it right and fix it fast. I need to get ahead of my issues, not chase them. These are consistent themes that we hear over and over and over again. So having defined the opportunity, let's dig just a little bit deeper into these common themes. Under the first bullet, multi-site retailers managing portfolios, and many times portfolios with hundreds or thousands of sites even, are struggling very much to, to in effect, manage aging HVAC lighting and refrigeration systems. And on top of that, we see with the uh, addition of smart assets, more devices being connected to the cloud, a, a real, real issue where there are, not, there are thousands of points to monitor and many devices at each site. So that is an increasing problem. Number two, keeping these sites and their assets performing at an optimal range while you're saving energy and delivering food safety are major challenges. These are many times um, competing or multiple high priorities, and there's a real challenge in balancing, reaching, or achieving all three. The third bullet, the result is that service teams, those individuals um, that are literally in the trucks and the managers running uh, those operations, with um, increasingly lean, and I would say new talent, are challenged to provide the information to those resources in a way that allow them to fix that problem and do so as quickly as possible. In effect, how do you add the domain knowledge or the experience that one worker has into the software so that you could maintain that, those corrective measures and, and achieve that fast? And then finally, the pressure is to do all of this with as low an operating cost and as high a margin as possible. So uh, next, Scott will get into the discussion on the actual solution. Thanks, Ron. And the components of the solution are gonna be familiar to most. Obviously, you have on one side managed services, oftentimes associated with alarm management historically in, in the space. And this is obviously where you will have, irrespective of, of which solution you're utilizing, some aspect of 
filtering of those alarms to try and reduce some of the noise, but then the big focus on getting that timely notification out to the resources who are actually gonna take care of that problem. So get to the things that are critical and notify on them as quickly as possible. And there's obviously some other managed services that can be added um, in addition to that. You'll see folks with dispatch services um, leveraging some of what the software serves up in tools such as set point management or energy or things like that and having some, some managed service operating over the top of that. And then of course you have the enterprise software and the key focus is, hey, do I have a remote view into the entirety of my enterprise out to those many devices that Ron was describing earlier? Can I go to a single interface, see everything that I potentially need to see and quickly get to, let's say I've received an alarm or I've received a call from the store or the hospital department or whoever that says I have a problem. Can I dig down to that very quickly, no matter where I am or what device I'm trying to get after it with? And then obviously the services that can be added on top of the software, such as some of your predictive maintenance, algorithms and applications, energy management, things of that nature. What has kind of changed over the last several years though, is it's moved away from these being viewed as two distinct offerings and more so coming to the understanding that if you have both of those things operating in concert and complementing each other, that's how you really drive the benefit. I think that'll be the primary focus of most of the best practices that we talk about as we go through the rest of, of this presentation. And another thing that has been changing pretty dramatically over the last period here is the number of roles and the types of roles that are actually leveraging these services within the organization. Um, we have a picture over here to the, to the left where we see the, the solution in the middle, you see the supermarket on the, on the far end where you have the store manager, you have the service technician in the field who needs to be directed on where to go and what to do. And then you obviously have some of those corporate functions or centralized functions that, we're, and that's where we really see a lot of the emerging need and, and demand for the services out of facility management, energy management, and food safety. And to hit on those a little bit more specifically, obviously your store managers, they, they don't want a technical solution. They wanna be focused on the customer. So their key requirement from these services are, hey, tell me exactly what I need to focus on, but only when I need to focus on it, and then give me a tool that's really easy if I have to go in and look at something to actually see what is important to me. So that user interface needs to be extremely intuitive, visual, and, and touch enabled. Whereas your service technician has that same requirement for real-time notification of issues that need to be addressed, but when it comes to the interface with the application, they want that more technical view. So that same solution needs to provide the very simple view for the store manager, as well as the technical one that will allow the technician to dig into the problem and know much more clearly what they're gonna run into once they get to site. And floating in the middle there, you tend to have an alarm technician, um, for lack of a better term, that could be an internal group at the company's knock, it could be a third party that's providing those alarm management services. But in either case, that technician is gonna be utilizing that solution to first receive those alarms, have them filtered down to a more manageable number, but then leveraging that software to do some remote triage, eliminate as much of the noise as possible and make sure they're communicating just those critical items out to that store manager or service technician. Facility managers, have always been in play, but they're wanting more and more to control, lock down, and manage their environments. And we'll get to that in more detail in, in a few slides. Um, the energy manager is very similar. They want to, somewhat like the store manager, a very intuitive interface that allows them to get in and draw out exactly the information they need to serve their dashboard requirements, analysis requirements, all of those sorts of things to make sure they have a, a very clean and simple view of how energy is being consumed across the operation. And then we have a, an emerging requirement really from food safety, which we see out in the market with many customers, many operators, food safety is, is having more and more power in the decisions of what should the solution look like, even what should equipment spec look like, 
And as they get more ingrained into the actual operating, they need to have these views as well that are supported by the software. And next round, I'll talk a bit about the key requirements for the software specifically. Thanks, Scott. Please take a look at the diagram that's dominant on the slide. You see the bottom in purple, the IoT device. That's commonly called the data and device layer. Um, fancy way for saying that is the source for all data. And the, the key to the value I talked about previously is the quality of that data. So it, it's, not, it's not too hard to understand that without getting the data that, that is required, nothing upstream, nothing up going to the top of that diagram to the enterprise software can be trusted or have value unless that data is accurate. So some of the criteria for that data is, is it, is it acquired at the right rate? Is that data something that, that is uh, consistent in how it's named? Is the context of that data understood? In effect, a temperature by itself might have a value. That temperature correlated with pressure and some other uh, attribute becomes even more valuable. So maybe stating the obvious, the, the IoT layer, the device layer, and the data that's generated from those devices is where all value is, is generated. And going up to the top of the graph, you get that data converted to what we call the presentation layer at the very top, where you see a highly graphical interface that interprets that information, as Scott was mentioning, to the particular roles that people are playing. A, a, one, a one view of providing that aggregated data is important, and you could move from a, a map view that shows which sites um, are in alarm or need attention all the way down to our particular asset. So in, in, in very simple terms, always be aware that the, the device or the data layer is the source of all value, and that value must be presented in a way that is easy to interpret by the role-based players. And every enterprise software needs to do that um, with that aggregated data. Moving over to the left, I'll pick only on a few of those bullets that I think are really significant. The second bullet, high performance at scale. Um, many applications, many solutions may operate um, efficiently for maybe a site or tens of sites. Um, that, that's typically not so much of a challenge but when you begin to look at performance at scale, or you have 50, 100, hundreds of sites, and even 1,000, where you have maybe um, thousands of points per site being updated at specific rates and transferred um, uh, to web-based storage locations, you, you really begin to understand how important performance at scale is. You can't have technicians or anyone waiting minutes um, on their mobile devices or even at their desk for something to update. It's really critical that a key requirement is the overall performance, the update of that information to get your job done. Sometimes it's as near real time as possible. Sometimes updates a few times a day, sometimes a day plus one, but be very critical of what the performance is of that enterprise software at scale. The next bullet uh, that has the word global in it um, I, would, I would like to focus on the fact that global implies central management of sites, uh, one to many, let's say, uh, from a central location. Um, we can also do per site kind of mo uh, monitoring, excuse me, but, but the global capability of doing it from a central location is really critical. And then going to, let's say, the, the last bullet, the open architecture with API for application interface. Um, it is really critical that we understand that today, sharing information from an enterprise software system is mandatory, both at the device layer where the information needs to be shared with partners that might provide a particular area of expertise. It might be energy, it might be fault diagnostics, but the, the concept of a one-size-fits-all or a totally closed architecture really does not meet the requirements of today's, of today's um, businesses. And now Scott will get into the details of these best practices. And starting with some of the software best practices, 
the, the first one, and, and Ron had mentioned this a bit, is when he was talking about global management and really set point management. So set point management has been around in, in several flavors from, from several providers for some time. The base concept of set point management was commissioning your site primarily with a focus on energy optimization and then setting that benchmark and tracking changes from that to make sure you maintain the benefit of that commissioning. And that still remains one of the primary focuses there. But what has really been emerging lately is the idea of standards and using it to also help press and reinforce standards within the organization. So naming conventions, um, if we look at different asset types and different products that's being housed in those assets as food safety gets involved and making sure that those standards are consistent across the, the organization, um, that point management becomes a way to identify that, track that, and call out any changes and work very hand in hand with user access management. So user access management has always been a component of enterprise software as well. What do I need to view? What do I need to be able to change? When I log in, does it recognize me and, and show me the things that I'm interested in? That still remains a key component as well, but where you can also then start to take that is operators are starting to lock things down at the actual controller at the store and saying, you know what, I don't want someone standing in front of that controller with unfettered access and the ability to make changes and those changes are made based on sometimes not an individual user ID, so auditing becomes a challenge. So what operators are starting to do is lock down at the controller layer, force users to come in through the software and make whatever changes they're going to make. That way you can A, control what changes they're able to do, and when they make those changes, you see not only that the change was made, you're capturing it with that point, you're driving that forward, you also see specifically who made that change, when they made it, what other changes those users are making, and really allows you to lock things down at the enterprise level and have that control that most facility management teams are looking for today. And tied in with predictive analytics, which again is saying, can I utilize algorithm-based services to recognize if I have a growing issue with a particular asset or with refrigerant leakage or anything like that, can I recognize the problem before I have an actual failure continues to be the focus of predictive analytics. But with all three of these things, one realization that many operators are coming to is they all represent potential benefit. So you can have the predictive analysis analytics serving up potential issues to you. You can have the set point management serving up changes and asking you to review them. But unless you have someone actually doing that on a reasonable cadence and keeping up with it, you have difficulty extracting the benefit of that tool. So many folks are finding that they need to actually establish a team or at least resources who are focused on that. And their, their sole purpose is leveraging those tools to derive the benefit from them. And because of the increasing cost pressures that many operators are under today, um, oftentimes leveraging a managed service to do exactly that um, ends up being the best approach. And shifting gears just a little bit to some best practices of alarm management, obviously, as we mentioned earlier, the, the first priority continues to be immediate notification of critical alarm and getting that to the specific person who's actually gonna take action. That's still the core focus. Um, and again, there are many offerings out there for alarm management, some of them with that are, are highly automated um, leveraging um, some of the basic alarm processes that are existing for fire and, and things like that, or more focused specifically on refrigeration alarms. And they may have people involved, they may not, and oftentimes they will have a filtering component. So an ability to go in and set based upon assets and alarm type, what are, the, what are the alarms that are potentially critical that I wanna make sure I put in front of someone? And oftentimes that filtering can have a pretty significant benefit, just the machine filtering of anywhere from, it's a wide range, frankly, but anywhere from you know 25 to 75% of alarms can be dealt with with the various machine filters that are out there. 75% kind of being that real best practice level that, that folks can get to. And most operators tend to stop at that level. Um, but some of the emerging best practice that we see, um, one of them, first of all, is being able to assign priorities by alarm type. 
Most systems today operate on a first in, first out basis. They don't differentiate a lot between the various alarms that are coming in. But if you think about it from the person who's receiving that alarm, you really want to be able to understand how it is, which is the first one I should focus on. And am I sure I'm getting that alarm in front of the right person? So a couple of things that priority allow you to do, again, to move away from that first in, first out mentality and say, hey, if I have a high critical alarm, let's say it's a rack failure, product temperatures, things like that, let's make sure we're getting that out for immediate review versus lower level things that maybe could even benefit from some bake time like case temperatures and things like that because you see a high instance of return to normal there. At the same time, you can also specify the contact channel based on priority. So if you have low priority alarms, sort of the opposite, say it's a sensor alarm, filter alert, things like that, I don't necessarily need someone looking at that in the next 15 minutes. The more appropriate channel to contact that person through instead of a really heavy phone call would be send them an email that they can review or even a daily report sometime. So really the key point there is being able to utilize alarm priority to make sure you are contacting the right person. Most, you know, if, if I need to get to this person quickly, make sure I'm doing that. If, and then based upon that priority as well, saying what is the proper channel? How is that most readily consumed and aligning that with the priority? And of course, the other best practice is, do you have actual triage being performed? And this is where we see the marriage between an alarm service and enterprise software. Because obviously, in order to more deeply triage that event, you need to have access to the device that's actually in alarm. So this is where you have either internal or third-party alarm management resources receiving that alarm, dialing into the actual system and viewing the current condition and determining if it's returning to normal, if it is truly critical and needs to be uh, contacted on right now. And we can kind of see a little view of how that works kind of on the right-hand side where I'm dialing into the actual asset, perhaps pulling a multi-point graph so I can see was the door open, was it recently in defrost, can I make an intelligent um, determination on this alarm and then take the appropriate steps. And the key there is if you combine all these things together, we often see up to 90% of those raw alarms that come out of all of those devices being eliminated as, as noise or something that can be dealt with at a later time. And it's just that 10% of critical things that we're actually engaging the teams on for, for them to address. And we talked about getting things to the right resource, um, not only by priority, but also by alarm type. So oftentimes we'll see with alarm management services where you have a single contact for a particular site or location. And that person doesn't deal with all of those issues. It makes perfect sense to send an air temp or a door alarm to the store manager or store personnel because they can actually go out and do something about that alarm. But if it's a mechanical alarm, they're not really going to do anything unless they need to move product or something along those lines. That alarm should really go to the maintenance or service technician. So having a flexible enough process to actually say, based upon alarm type, I know who to contact because they're the ones most likely to take action on that alarm is something that we're seeing a lot more of out in the market. And we mentioned food safety as well. And not that you're gonna route a product temperature alarm to the food safety team for them to fix, but oftentimes we're now seeing them copied in on that activity so they are aware that there's something going on and if they need to execute any process or procedure with the store personnel based upon that product temperature alert, we're seeing more and more of that. And another best practice that's emerging is, is really closing the loop. So oftentimes with alarm notification, you'll have a service that notifies of an alarm and once they've notified the appropriate person, that process is completed. Obviously, that doesn't mean anything has been fixed. It doesn't mean that alarm's not going to repeat and come back in and have to be contacted a second time. So what we see more and more is a closed loop process that says, hey, we're going to notify the alarm, but then we're going to leverage an event management system that will allow that alarm to be tracked and straight through to a corrective action being captured and entered into the system that way you have an audit of not only the fact that alarms were 
that alarms occurred, that they were notified on, but also that at some point they were closed and this was the corrective action taken and obviously analytics and, and reporting can be driven off of that. And we talked a little bit about the flexible contact channel in the, in the last part, um, but again, not just based on priority or anything, but different departments want to consume that data in different channels. So it makes probably the most sense to call a store manager because there is a known line, someone always answers it, we can get a hold of somebody. But to the degree that they have a mobile device and we could send a mobile notification to that device, for those customers, that's probably the most efficient way. So it's understanding that that contact channel can also be varied by priority, time of day, or any other consideration. And when we talk about closing the loop, one of the most impactful ways to do that is if an operation has a work order management system such as Verisa, Carigo, Service Channel, making sure that we're taking that alarm, if a work order needs to be created, that there's an integration between the alarm management system and that work order management system that actually creates that event, ensures it's captured, routed to the right people, and then that really eases that back end, the closing of the loop relative to those. So that's something that more and more we are seeing. And Ron mentioned it earlier, having the ability to interact with, with other services. This is just one example of that. And obviously as you get towards the end of this, you, you have the reporting that drives out of everything that's being done. A little bit of an example on the right, but Ron will go a little bit more into the role-based reporting that many folks are asking for. Thanks, Scott. Almost without exception, <clears throat> there is a high emphasis on reporting uh, when uh, we uh, meet with customers because, because you could do a lot of things right and if the reporting is not correct, then the value you're trying to achieve is greatly diminished. So as we've said a few times before, tailoring the output to the user is what the expectation is and it should be met. If we look at some of the examples in the upper left-hand corner the, for a service provider, you know, a, a busy technician wants to, to quickly and easily diagnose a problem and resolve it um, at the asset level, and they would love to have access to information on demand or at a real-time basis. The, the small picture might show a floor plan with an asset and actual values. That is the level at which a technician gets their job done and delivers their value. So, so you can tell from that diagram or that, that report what the requirement is and at what level. If you move to the right for facility manager, a facility manager needs um, more summary data, more historical performance information, because uh, he or she is managing sites with more of a maybe financial focus where daily, monthly, and yearly comparisons need to be made with filtering. So you could tell at a glance that the type of information on the left-hand side for service provider and technician doesn't look like and should not look like the information that's more summary-based and more historical for the facility manager. In the bottom left for food safety or food quality, a, a, a growing um, area of focus today, you really want condensed information where the food quality manager or food safety manager needs to have access to the information for an audit. Um, to show that the food has been in compliance to meet safety standards, what was in or out of range, and for how long. So um, there's also need for food safety individuals, food quality individuals, to be able to communicate that performance up to financial managers. What has been the impact of, let's say, for example, converting a process from manual temperature monitoring to something that's more automated that saves time? Are my, are my chefs, for example, taking the um, food temperatures at a time that's required and converting it to digital, replacing manual? There's all kind of time and money savings and value creation from following that process. And, and Ron, this is also another place where we see corrective actions being captured. So oftentimes, and particularly if you step over into the healthcare space, when you have an excursion as it's typically called, where something has gone out of range for a period of time, there has to be a record of, yes, this was recognized, there was a corrective action taken, this is what it was, and then that's very important, like you said, from an audit perspective for those things to be 
able to be demonstrated. Yeah, from the old from the old stated days, maybe a sequence of events. You know what what happened and when, and have an audit trail is really important. In the bottom right hand corner for energy management, uh, those people in charge of that, if you look at that data, have a have a mix of what are those assets that are outside of range or performing um, outside of the most efficient band need to see that on a per asset basis, a per site basis, many times for lighting versus HVAC assets versus refrigeration assets. So they need both a top level view, let's say a totem pole of what sites are out of band or out of range, drill down to that site and be able to identify what particular assets are misbehaving and then quickly take the control action to bring them into um, the, the proper range. They also need uh, more sophisticated tools that ha are called measurement and verification. So above the need to identify sites that are outliers, they need to have reports that get into much more specifics that, that basically characterize each one of those assets so that very precise corrective action can be taken. So as a summary, we have just four examples of different types of reporting and the need for flexibility and the need for a wide range of display types and what we call widgets um, is pretty evident. And, and I think the last point there, Ron, as well, is you have these roles. When I log in, we talked about user maintenance, user, user access. When I log in, it recognizes this is who I am, this is my role, this is what I like to see. And these would present automatically to those folks in those roles. So in the next slide, Go back, please. Trigger finger. Thank you. So this use case typically um, pulls together a lot of the themes that we're, we're trying to uh, communicate. And this will be around the life of a field technician. And you look at the one, two, three, and four colors and the tombstone at the bottom. In, in only four steps and, and very few um, clicks, if you want to call it that, you could move from a macro view that provides a, a view of an entire nation or an entire region that you might be responsible for down to the site that will be identified in red that needs more attention down to the actual asset. So uh, under number one, the advisories are prioritized by high, medium, and low. And right to the right of that smart device could be a phone or a tablet. Um, and just as an aside, uh, mobility or mobility as number one or mobility one is absolutely alive and well today. If you don't get the right information in the hands of technicians or those people at the point of actual corrective action at the site, um, you're, you're really going to compromise your ability to, to, to create value. So it's not by accident that we're showing a picture of the, of the phone or it could be a tablet. So you go from that macro view and you move to the uh, uh, first panel where you see that there are five red events, five high priority events that you can scroll through. So even if you're busy, even if you're distracted, it is very quick and easy to identify a high, medium, low, and that you've got high, five high priority events to focus on. Then moving to the right with just one, with one click, you get into more detail of that advisory. And it's kind of hard to see what some of those characteristics are, but you see What's the site? The return to normal. When did the alarm return to normal? What is its priority? Um, and it gives you that information that you need in order to determine whether or not that alarm is still alive and well and if it needs attention. If you notice at the bottom, there's room for comments. The ability to add a history or, or insights to that event is critical because we have, or excuse me, customers can then download those comments by a particular event and get, quote unquote, a history of what has been the corrective action for that event. And it turns out to be a really important part of the knowledge base. So Scott, when you were mentioning, you know, the, the, the IP associated with it, that is an example of how comments can be added to the interpretation of alarm for those technicians that are new and don't have the experience. And then, with only just one more step all the way to the right, you can get access to the and drill down to the actual point 
and its actual historical um, record so that the information that's led up to the event is, is very telling when you're trying to diagnose that event and in effect adds to the kind of um, fault diagnostics that would go to the next step. What are those things that contribute to that, to that fault and how do we recognize it going forward? So to repeat, mobile device clearly identified by priority being in red, scroll through, pick the most appropriate, troubleshoot with the additional details, go over to the, to the actual historical IO point itself for further diagnosis, and then jump to the actual controller, which we don't have pictured, where you could actually execute the corrective action. So I think that's, that's clear. W one editorial comment. If these four steps would be handled, shall we say, with traditional um, software or highly manual steps, imagine trying to do this with just front panel controls, no graphics, and it would take, and you repeat this five, six, seven, 10, 20 times a day. So if you save 10, 15 minutes um, with every technician across the country, the savings associated with increasing the efficiency of that workforce is very significant. So just keep in mind that we're talking about lots of events repeated and if you have saved 10 minutes times the number of stores and technicians, the numbers are, are pretty amazing and they get pretty high pretty quickly. So now we'll get into um, the summary of what we were talking about relative to best practices and get into some specifics about what you can save. Sure. And, and really tying it back to the opportunities that we looked at right off the top, and we've got the four of those on on the left-hand side here, and then just tying some of the best practices to each of those. And the first one is really what Ron was just talking about. What is some of that inherent operational labor savings and just time savings when you have that centralized management view control and also being able to uh, document what has happened and, and serve up your reporting? And so usually in a lot of that, and we didn't, he wasn't really talking about set point broadcast, but that's another big thing that a lot of your, your enterprise software will have the capability to do one to many changes that you can broadcast out if we think lighting schedules changes, things like that, um, you know, holidays and, and whatnot. So you have some things that are very time specific, but other things that are just everyday operation where that benefit is. And it's not insignificant, um, this is a little, editorial piece here, all of the benefits we've listed are kind of what we see. Um, it, it is pretty focused on our customers because that's the data we have. We believe it is a, a good view of the market, but really try to target what would the benefit be for your average 250 site grocery chain um, is what these numbers are tied to. And so we see the benefit there at estimated at a million dollars annually. Um, the next one is really kind of that, that primary benefit and focus of alarm management. Are we avoiding food loss? Um, so through the whole filtering, triage, and, and timely notification, getting it to the right person to address the issue quickly, typically what we see is, is 25 to 30% of that perishable shrink is able to be impacted there uh, because those are the things that are, are typically driven by actual refrigeration failure. Um, and that looks like around $2.1 million annually, again, for that, that typical 250-site grocery chain. Um, the next one we look at is the fact that your services teams, whether those are internal or external, have access to remotely view the site in the event that they're contacted by either an alarm management service or by their store stating that there's a problem. They can get out there, do some remote triage. Oftentimes what we see is they can avoid that immediate truck roll, particularly if we're talking about a third party service provider, and they can either add things to a preventative maintenance call or do a next day versus overnight, things like that, um, or just make a setting change through the system that, that will get them to where they need to be. What we tend to see is at least one truck roll per store monthly that can be eliminated through that process. Again, a pretty conservative number, but when you look at a, a fleet this size, you're talking about another $1.5 million in potential annual benefit there. Um, and the last one that, that we call out 
is really talking again, we, we spent some time on set point and energy management and just everything that goes into that. So maintaining that the benefits of a com fully commissioned site, energy optimized, not allowing those set points to drift due to maintenance and other activity, but staying on top of it, keeping those optimal set points in place, typically can help you impact about 4% of, of that annual energy spend, which you know, equates to about $2.7 million annually. So quite a bit of, of uh, benefit there. Um, again, really focus on what we tend to see with our customers, but uh, also a little bit on the conservative side. Scott, just to, to, to chime in a little bit, um, through the years, um, I, I, I've sensed quite a bit of frustration on the part of, of accounts on, well, either you give no number because there's so many exceptions that you, you hedge and say, I'm not going to give a number, or the number is so crazy high that you don't believe it. So the reason I bring that up is you want to find and work with a company that that engages you in a way that understands your specific process, the specifics of your sites, so that the number that you derive, that, that value calculation is something that you believe in um, and, can, and can work off of that number. So you can, you can hone the 1 million to 250,000. You could get the energy savings down to what makes sense for what you're willing to turn on, turn off. So what I'm saying is, if the number seems um, like it may vary based on the percentages or the actual number, we made an assumption, but we didn't want to have no number or no percentage. And so I would invite those on the call to understand that only with the deeper engagement and the domain expertise of the company you engage with can you and should you get to a number you believe that is, that is real for your company and you can derive all your ROI, your return on investment, based on something that you believe in and you find factual. So that's kind of my last editorial comment, that be sticklers, be um, demanding on coming to a number that's derived as something that you participate in and you believe in. Okay, thank you, Ron and Scott. Um, they're going to be here for the question and answer portion of our event, which is what we are um, to the point of now. And as a reminder, to participate in a question and answer, type your question into the text area and hit send, and please keep the send to default as all panelists. Okay, so our first question is, what do you see as the biggest facility management or asset management challenge today? Well, the, quite frankly, it seems almost too obvious, and that is you could identify the energy conservation measures to take. You could identify what are the most, most important alarms. You could do every one of our best practices, but where almost every company falls down in not realizing all of the benefit is not dedicating the resource or resources um, to actually realizing and executing those changes and putting in the controls that, that maintain that change over time. So much like Scott was mentioning set point where you could commission a site and four days later it's not performing the way it was, same thing with the best practices. You may identify the best practices, spend the money, and um, if you don't put in those, those controls to keep those things in place and execute, then quite frankly, you degrade back down to and you've basically wasted your money. And so part of the best practice is what is that process by which you sustain and implement those changes? And I think I'd just add one, one thing onto that, Ron. So yes, having the, the organizational support and defining the resources that are gonna drive that. But then I think also on the side of the solution, making sure that you know, one size fits all tends to be a challenge. It has to be have at least a level of flexibility that allows you to align how you're gonna deliver that solution to your operational reality. So how do we operate today? Can we align this process, this flow to that so that it just naturally happens? One, one more thing, Nina, if I could hurry up and, and mention it would be, we definitely understand that there is a range of, 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 of types 
or segments of a customer or user from almost self-performing where they have the luxury of having their own staff and people that they can have control over to an account that requires full service capability because they don't have the expertise or the, or the people in-house and the hybrid in between. So the ability to, to map the solution um, with partners that help you execute from, hey, just give me the tool, just give me the software, all the way through to, hey, I need the full service, is something that you really have to understand going into how you would execute those best practices. Next question. Do most companies you work with currently use smart devices? Meaning connected devices. Right. Phones. Mm -hmm. Yes. And help. I would say that it varies on role quite dramatically. So typically a lot of those, we talked about some of the, the centralized or corporate functions, they're much more likely to have the device. We still see whether it's, it's on a hospital floor or out in the, on the grocery floor, um, they tend to not have those, sometimes not a, a company issued phone even. And that's why you still have some limitation as to that contact channel. How can we get, a, and that's where I think aligning with how do you operate today is important. So understanding how are we arming the folks out in the field for that. So, it's emerging, definitely. We see more people with devices, but I would say the, the prevalence, particularly on that layer that you're going to initially contact with, they're, they're still not using those. I mean, as often as you would think. Yeah. I mean, specifically, uh, Nina, whoever asked the question, um, the, the, the standard deviations are from I'm still using a phone call, which is acceptable, yeah. or manual, because I've got a small 20 store or 10 store portfolio, to a large a customer, large account that has everyone equipped with a tablet, and, and there's a different problem. I've got 20 applications on it. How, how do I find the one that's most valuable? Now you've got a, a different issue with how do you make sure you're trained and how do you find the most value out of those applications, both extremes. But I, I would say the other place where we do see a lot of penetration with the use of, of mobile devices is on the service technician side, both internal and, and third party. So that's where you, you tend to have a lot of that available. Next question. You, you gave us a lot of best practices today. Where should I start? I, that's a really interesting question. I think it really, again, that comes down to your individual situation. So if you have consistency in control type in your fleet, enterprise software can be very readily brought to bear. But if you are not very homogenous in the back end, things are very different. Oftentimes, leveraging a managed service for specific solutions like alarm management is maybe the first play to go after because there's just a lot more noise in that situation, not a lot of consistency. You need someone to help you drive through that. Scott, it's, it's just to pile on, every company is unique. Some are at the beginning of their journey, some are in the middle, some are highly advanced. Yeah. And so it's going to vary based on their technology maturity. It's going to be based on their appetite for data. It's, there's a lot of factors, but uh, being able to identify the one that matches your company is most important. For example, Sometimes we're asked to do an energy pilot, right? I mean, do, do a proof of concept, establish a baseline. And the first question is, well, how many people do we have to dedicate? How long does it take? You know, and the answer is, you want to have as low a threshold as possible. Pick five sites, that's accurate. We'll handle that with the project so that, so that we want to make that first step. Any company would want to make that first step as easy as possible, mm -hmm. use the least amount of resources. Like get, without hedging too much, it varies by each, but, but make sure you match the requirement for the, for the supply. Last question. You talked about predictive analytics. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? So predictive analytics are, I mean, Ron kind of walked through the, the, the pyramid, right? You start at that device layer, and then you walk up through controls and up to the data piece. Um, really predictive analytics are saying, hey, we're going to utilize that controller level log data 
and then other external data like outdoor air temperatures, things like that, to support a predictive service like full lot sleep detection. It says, hey, do I have the ability to model expected performance, compare that to actual performance, and identify any deltas, and then put those deltas in front of someone for analysis and say, hey, do I actually have a problem? Is this a slow leak and I can catch it at this point? as opposed to when I've got refrigerant on the floor. Um, you know, those sorts of things, looking at compressor cycling and determining, do I have a compressor that's operating outside of the band and is looking towards early failure and needs to be addressed? I'm gonna go to my soapbox again. The, the, the accuracy and reliability of fault diagnostics goes back to the quality and richness of that data. Yep. If an algorithm needs 10 points acquired at one minute each, and you get two points in an hour, you get the idea. There's no value to that algorithm. And second of all, when you build that algorithm, um, if, if the company or supplier has a lot of domain expertise and that data and the data science, now you've got an algorithm, an output that you have high confidence in. Because what you don't want is an algorithm that's going to give you yet more noise. noise that you don't want to deal with. So you're building a filter to manage algorithms defeats the entire purpose. Agreed. Thank you, Ron and Scott. That's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you all for your participation. As a reminder, a few days after this live event, you can access this presentation on demand at climate.emerson.com slash E360 webinars. And you'll also receive an email in the next few days with a link to this recorded event. On behalf of Emerson, thank you for attending today's E360 webinar. Information and registration will be available soon for our next webinar. We hope you can join us again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.